الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد respected uh, brothers sisters uh, respected uh, scholars السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Mashallah, it's nice to be in Peterborough. First time I've been, besides the times I've come for a passport. Uh, this is the first time, Alhamdulillah. The topic is the, the final days. <coughs> One may ask the question, why, why does a person want to know about the final days? What, what's the reason? If we look into one of the most renowned ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, which is related by Imam Bukhari in his Sahih and it's known as the Hadith of Jibra'il where Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu, says one day we were sitting in the company of the Prophet وسلم, and a man all of a sudden entered the room. He came to the Prophet وسلم, and he placed his knees next to the knees of the Prophet and he says that none of us recognized him. There was no, none of us recognized him and nor were there any signs of travel upon him. Meaning, if he was from Medina, we would have recognized him. If he was a traveler, well, you had the desert environment, he would have had signs that he had traveled in the desert. So none of us recognized him and nor did he have any signs. He had very black hair, he had very white clothes. So there was no signs that he had traveled. He came and he sat next to the Prophet ﷺ and he placed his knees next to the knees of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he asked the Prophet ﷺ, what is Iman? And the Prophet ﷺ explained to him what Iman was. And then he affirmed the answer. And Umar says, we found this very strange. You ask a question and then you affirm the answer. Then he asked about Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ told him about Islam and then he said, You have spoken the truth, you are right. And Umar says again, we found this very strange. Then he asked about Ihsan. And the Prophet ﷺ explained to him what Ihsan was. And then he affirmed it again. And then he said, Mata sa When is the final hour? And the Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Mal mas'ulu anha bi'a'lama min as the one who's being asked, it, the knows no more than the one who's asking. Meaning, you don't know, nor do I know. So then he said, "Akhbirni, fa akhbirni an ashratiha." Tell me the signs of the final hour. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Until the amatu rabbataha," that when a slave girl will give birth to her own master. What this means, the ulama give many interpretations. And then he said another thing. He said, another sign of the Day of Judgment. He said, you will see the barefooted, half naked, destitute, shepherds, they will compete with each other in making the highest buildings. And then he left. And after a while, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, Oh Umar, do you know who that was? That was Jibra'il. He came to teach you your deen. No narration of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu has so many arqan, so many asuls, so many fundamentals of Islam as the hadith of Jibra'il. And you see in it, it also speaks about the final hour, the final day, the sign of the final day. Why does a believer need to know the final day and the sign of the final day? See, this is the role of the prophets. When the Quran speaks about this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Amma yatasa'alun anin naba'il adheem. They dispute regarding it. They ask each other. Uh, regarding what? Allah says, anin naba'il adheem. The word naba'il adheem means the great matter. The great matter. 
The word Naba comes from the word Nabuwa. The word Nabuwa means prophethood. Because one of the functions of a prophet is that he informs you about those things which will come. And the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed the believers. Why did he inform the believers? Because see, when you hear the prophecies of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he prophesied 1400 years ago, it, it strengthens a believer's iman. One marvels, how did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he lived in a rural area in the desert 1400 years ago and he said many many things which throughout history have come to pass and you can say nothing when you see these signs a believer strengthens his iman and he says nothing besides Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah In the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there was a man called Suhail ibn Amr so Hayl ibn Amr was very eloquent, but he was a mushrik. He would always debase the Muslim, defame the Muslims. So one day they caught him in one of the battles. So Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu said, Messenger of Allah, let me knock his teeth out. Let me knock his teeth out. So next time he tries to speak ill about the Muslims, his tongue will come out and people will laugh at him. So the Prophet sallallahu said, no. And then he said to Umar, he said, oh, Umar, what about maybe a time will come that Suhail will stand somewhere and he will use his eloquence and you will be happy with his eloquence. Suhail embraces Islam later on. The message of Allah passes away and after he passed away, there was a huge rebellion in the Arab Peninsula. Suhail was in Mecca. And Suhail stood up and many of the people in Mecca were about to rebel. And Suhail stands up and he uses his eloquence. He uses his speech and he quashes the rebellion. And Umar is in Medina and they tell Umar ibn al-Khattab, they said, oh, Umar, the people of Mecca were about to rebel and Suhail with his eloquence, he quashed the rebellion. And Umar ibn al-Khattab in Medina, he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his true messenger. There was a sahabi called Adi, Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu anhu, he was a prince. He was the leader of his tribe, the, the Ta'i, the Bani Ta'i. And he says, I came into Medina, here's a prince, he comes into Medina. And he says, I'm walking with the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the streets of Medina. And all of a sudden, he's stopped by this African slave woman. And she says, Oh Muhammad, speak to my master. Oh message of Allah, speak to my master, for he overburdens me. And Adi says, I knew from this incident that this man wasn't a prince or a king. Because you can't stop kings and princes in the middle of the street. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to her, he said, hold my hand and take it to any street in Medina and ask me for assistance and I will assist you. And Adi says, I knew that this man was something special because the lowest people that you could have in society were the females and then after the females the african slaves and the message of allah saying take me anywhere and i will assist you and then he goes to the house of the message of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said oh he said oh adi embrace islam and adi said i'm already a person of religion i'm a christian i don't need to follow any other religion so the message of allah said i know more about christianity than you do and the Prophet Sallallahu begins to explain Christianity to him. And Adi is, Adi is astonished at the knowledge of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Adi, a time will come that the woman will travel from Iraq all the way to Mecca all by herself. And nobody will interfere with her. From Hira in Iraq all the way to Mecca and she will do tawaf and nobody will interfere with her. He said, oh Adi, a time will come that we will take the palaces and the jewels of Hurmuz bin Kisra. Hurmuz bin Kisra was the Persian leader, the most powerful man on the face of this earth. 
And Adi said, Hormuz bin Kisra. And the Messenger of Allah said, Hormuz bin Kisra. He said, Oh Adi, a time will come that a Muslim will go out to give his zakat and his sadaqah and he will find nobody there to accept his zakat and his sadaqah. Adi later on, he embraced Islam. And he says, By Allah, I with my own eyes saw women traveling from Iraq all the way to Mecca, all by themselves, did dwarf around the Kaaba and nobody interfered with them. He said, by Allah, I was in that army which defeated Hormuz bin Kisra. And he said, I swear by Allah, a time will come. It hadn't come yet. He said, a time will come that people will go out and give their zakat and sadaqah and there will be nobody there ready to accept their zakat and sadaqah. In the time of Umar ibn Khattab in certain provinces, this happened. In the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, his governor of North Africa, Yahya bin Sa'id, he went out, he found nobody who was eligible for zakat. So he sent a letter to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahmatullah alayhi, and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, find some non-Muslim and give him the zakat. He found no non-Muslim who was eligible for zakat. And then he said, then he wrote another letter. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, then, then find a slave, find somebody and spend it upon that person. But see, throughout history, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has come with prophecies. But the believer is not interested. The believer, if you study the prophecies of the message of Allah, wallahi, this in itself, this in itself is enough for a person to believe. You heard of a man, what's his name? What's his name? Go on, say it. Nostradamus. You heard of Nostradamus? Nostradamus lived in the 1500s. If you look at his prophecies and his prediction, they're vague, they're woolly, they're, they're ambiguous. But since the 1500s, his books have never been out of print. People take his word as revelation. They take his word as revelation. Whilst the prediction of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are bang on, are, are clear. 1400 years ago, he predicted things and you see them happening even now. In front of your eyes, you see them happening. So you had another reason. Why a believer studies the signs of the day or the, studies, the, the signs of the final hour is why? It's because he, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned people. He warned the believers. And when he's already been warned, he sees these signs and he stays away from them. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when Dajjal will come. Dajjal will come and many people will say, Oh Dajjal's in town. Let's go and see what's happening. So they will go and see what's happening with Dajjal and they will be get caught. Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they will get caught up in the fitna of Dajjal. They will get caught up in the fitna of Dajjal because that will be a time when people will not have much knowledge. So they will say, yeah, Dajjal's in town. I wonder what he's handing out. There's a guy called Dajjal in town. Let's go and see. Maybe he's giving some Ambala out. So they will go and they will go and check out Dajjal and they will get embroiled in the fitna of Dajjal. See, there are certain things. There are certain things only Allah knows. Let me mention two of those things that only Allah knows. One is the time of your death. And one is the final hour. And they have a deep relationship. How do they have a deep relationship? See, the, the reason they have a deeper relationship is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man mata faqad qamat qiyamatuhu. Whoever dies, his qiyamat has started. The day you die, that's your qiyamat. And this is known as qiyamatu sughra, the small qiyamah. And then you have qiyamatu qubra. And also only Allah knows when that will occur. And that will be after the final hour. See, the relation, also the relationship is what? The relationship is this. See, nobody knows when they're going to die. When the angel of death comes and you see, comes to you and you say, yeah, uh, you're here. Why don't you phone me before you came down? 
you know, they live in England, everybody's got a mobile phone, you should just let me know. They read a couple of rakats, you know, prayed my two rakat, done a bit of tawbah. You know, why don't you send me a postcard? He'd say, I sent you enough postcards. Do you see the children dying around you? Do you see the babies dying around you? That was your postcard. Do you see the youth? Many youth, mashallah, here. Do you see the youth dying? Nobody has a guarantee of tomorrow. Wasn't that a lesson? Wasn't that a sign? Didn't you see how I bought the tsunamis and the hurricanes? How I destroyed cities? How I bought down villages? Didn't you see your hair going grey? Wasn't that a sign? Didn't you see the wrinkles on your face? Wasn't that a sign? These are all signs. He said, I sent you enough signs. And similarly, the final hour, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends signs. He sends plenty of signs. And, and there, nobody knows when it's going to occur. But wallahi, there is no doubt that it will occur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the final hour in the Quran, amazing. He says, اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّعَةُ اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّعَةُ He said, the final hour is close. For those who know the Arabic language, iqtarabat is madi, is past tense. Why is Allah using past tense for something which is gonna happen? Because in the Arabic language, if something there's no doubt that it will occur, then you use the past tense. And the day of judgment and the final hour will occur and there is no doubt. And Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, sa The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ana wa sa'atu kahate, bu'ithtu wa ana wa sa'atu kahate. He said, When I was sent, me and the hour are like this. This is how close we are. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu mentioned when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would mention about the final hour, he would raise his voice, he would become passionate. His, eye, his eyes would go red, his cheeks would go red, his veins would come out of his neck. And he was like a person, who, like a general who was warning on, regarding an oncoming army. That an army is about to attack you. This is how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was regarding the final hour. The final hour will occur. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it quite clear. But the thing is, what have me and you prepared for the final hour? What have me and you prepared for the final hour? That's the main thing. One day the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what a beautiful hadith. Now, one day the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was about to start the salah. He said, Allah Akbar. He was about to start the salah. And the Sahabi radiallahu anhu came in. And he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, mata sa'a? When is the sa'a? When is the final hour? And the Messenger of Allah carried on with his Salah. He finished his Salah. He turned around and he said, who asked that question? And he said, me, O Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ma talaha. What have you prepared for the final hour? Don't ask when it's going to occur. Watch the preparation. What actions have you done? And he said, O Messenger of Allah, I don't have many Salahs. I don't have many fasts. And the ulama are unanimous on this issue. This doesn't mean that he didn't pray. It didn't mean that he didn't fast. It meant that compared to some of the other sahaba who prayed more, who fasted more, his fasts were less. He said, I don't have much fasts. I don't have much salahs. But one thing I do know is that I love Allah and His Rasul. I love Allah and His Rasul. And the Prophet wasallam said, Al-mar'u ma man ahab. On the day of judgment, you will be with that person that you love. On that day, on the day of judgment, you will be with that person that you love. Whoever you love in this dunya, and Allah knows what's in your heart. Allah knows what's in your heart. You can say all day long, I love Allah and I love His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But your actions belie your statement. Do you understand? You, you, can, you can deceive everybody around you, but your actions belie your statement and Allah knows what's in the heart. Who's your role model in life? Because your role model in life is the role model that you will have in the hereafter. Al-mar'u ma'man ahab. Man will be with that person that he loves. 
And Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, he said, there was nothing more pleasing to the Sahaba than to know that in the hereafter that they would be with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the signs of the Day of Judgment, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that from the south, a, a wind will blow. And that at this time, when the wind will blow, that no Muslim will be left on the face of this earth. No Muslims. And then shortly after this, the Kaaba will be destroyed. The Kaaba will be destroyed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command Israfil to blow the trumpet. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Since Israfil was told that he would blow the horn, since the day he was told that he would blow the horn, he has never moved his eyes from the arsh of Allah because he does not want to delay the hukam of Allah even equivalent to a blink of the eye. He keeps his eye. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, How can I rest? When Israfil is waiting for the trumpet to be blown and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum found this very difficult when the Messenger of Allah said, then they couldn't relax either. So they said, came back to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, said, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil wa tawakkalna, wa tawakkalna ala Allah and we do tawakkal upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the day that the trumpet will be blown? Can you imagine? Allah says when the trumpet will be blown, فَفَزِئَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ When the trumpet will be blown. Let me do a proper translation. It's not trumpet, it's actually a horn. Sur is horn. When the horn will be blown, everybody in the heavens and the earth will shake. They will shake. They, they will become... They will become fearful they will become frightened is this the first time let me tell you about another noise which killed the nation this is israfil blowing the trump uh, the horn let me tell you about another nation another nation was who the qawm e thamud the qawm e thamud hamstrung the the she camel of saleh alayhi salatu wassalam and the narrations mentioned that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala killed them with a noise there was a huge scream and as a consequence they died. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَخَذَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا صَيْحَةُ That those who did dhulam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them with sayha. Sayha means a loud noise. Now listen to this. Sayha means a loud noise. In another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَخَذَتْ هُمْ الصَّائِقَ That a sa'iqa destroyed them. Sa'iqa is a loud noise which has a burning essence to it. Now, those who object on the Quran said, What's this? In one place, you got Sayha. In the other place, you got Sa'iqa. There's a contradiction. There's a contradiction. There's no contradiction. Because research has shown today and they're doing it in universities in America that if you can make a noise which is intense enough, it will have a burning essence. And this is why in America, in universities, they are making electricity out of sound waves. They are making electricity out of sound waves. Let, let, let me tell you the nature of noise. See, noise. At 120 decibels, your ears start to hurt. At 140 decibels, your ears pop. At 150 decibels, your rib cage begins to hurt. At 200 decibels, your lungs puncture. This is why they've done, they, 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 they've done this research on mice. At 184 decibels, not only did their lungs puncture, their livers packed up. This is the nature of noise. If you can make enough noise. Now today, advanced military research, they are creating what they call sonic. They call sonic weapons. Where you don't have to shoot a bullet anymore. You will just point the noise and, and you will shoot the noise to a certain area. And already, they said already, they can make your eye, eyeballs vibrate. They can make you nausea. 
and the European Space Agency said that we have a weapon in our arsenal which has the ability to kill. The Prophet Sallallahu was asked, what is the sur? What is the sur? Which is Rafil will blow. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Huwal qarn. Huwal qarn. It is a horn. This is no exaggeration. You can check it up. The European Space Agency, we have a weapon in our arsenal which has the ability to kill a sonic weapon. And they say it looks like a horn. They define it themselves. They say it looks like a horn. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْخَةِ فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّاعِقَةِ And in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الرَّجْفَةِ Rajfa means to tremble violently. Now, research has shown that if you make enough noise, it will pass the ears, pass affecting the ears, and it will, not only will it affect the ears, it's gone past affecting the ears, it will actually affect your muscles, your bones, and your, and your nervous system. And it will what? It will make you tremble violently. Who told the Messenger of Allah this? And this is why when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يشبع منه العلماء The ulama will never become satiated from the Qur'an. The most noise that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have heard in his time was what? A thunder. The thunder doesn't kill anybody. It doesn't kill. So where did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a sayha, then it speaks about sa'iqa, then it, and, and this is the same people. The Qawm Thamud, different places. Allah says Sayha, then He says killed by Sa'iqa, and He said, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الرَّجْفَ So the noise, so it started from a Sayha, and then it became a Rajfa, they began to tremble until it became so intense that it burnt them. It burnt them. If this is the noise in this dunya, subhanAllah, if this is the noise, then what will be the noise when Israfil blows the trumpet? What will the noise be? How, how will the noise be? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala depicts it in the Quran. Look at this. Is a shamsu kuwirat. Allah says when the horn will be blown, is a shamsu kuwirat. When the sun, the word kuwirat means when the inner part becomes comes out and the outer part goes in. It folds up. Can you imagine the sun? The sun. How far is the sun? 149 million kilometers away. 149 million kilometers away. Your existence depends upon the sun. If the sun went out, you would go out. 149 million kilometers. Millions of earths go into the sun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, is the shamsu kuwirat. When the trumpet will be and horn will be blown, that sun, which is 149 million kilometers away, it will, it will fold up. It, it will lose all its shine. The inner part will come out and the outer part will go in. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ kadarat." When on that day of judgment, when the trumpet will be blown, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, all the stars that you see, they will fall out of the sky like ping pong balls. They will get scattered. They will lose their luster. You know, you know how many stars there are? You know how many galaxies there are? This is observable galaxies, yeah? I'm not talking about, these are the galaxies that they can see. That they can see, not the ones that they can't see, those that they can see, they say there is over a billion galaxies. Over a billion galaxies. The galaxy that we live in is called the Milky Way. It's got nothing to do with chocolates, brothers. Nothing to do with chocolates. It's called the Milky Way. They say our galaxy has over 300 billion stars. They say if you gather all the stars in all the galaxies, that will be over a septillion stars. That is what? One followed by 24 zeros. Can you imagine? Look at the qudra of Allah. 
Look at the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when, when the trumpet is blown, they will scatter, fall out the sky like ping pong balls. A hundred, a, a, over a one septillion stars. Look at the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are observable. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ When the mountain will vanish, the mountains. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَ يَحْمِلْنَاهَا That we presented this amana, this responsibility of the deen. إِنَّ عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ Upon the heavens, upon the earth, and upon, uh, upon the mountains. Why does Allah mention these things? Because these are the enormities of the world. See, when you stand at the foot of a mountain and you look up, you get overawed. When you're in the middle of the sea, have you ever been in the middle of the sea and the depths of the night? Try it. Try it. Make sure you got good guys around you. Try it. I swear it will make you feel so insignificant. You know, often when people get lost in the sea, the boats go straight past them. The rescue boats go straight past them. The airplane goes straight over the head. What is it? In that vast sea, all you can see is one head. They don't notice them. They go past them many times. They don't notice them. And this is what Allah says. We presented this deen, this amana upon the heavens, upon the earth and upon the mountains. And they refuse to carry this because the mountains are one of the enormities of the world. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said to the mushrikeen that a day would come, that the earth will be destroyed. Allah recalls it in the Quran. Allah says, Jibal. They ask you about the mountains. They, was, they were shocked. They said, you trying to tell me that these mountains around Makkah will be destroyed? They could not believe it. The, they had never seen Everest. They were speaking about the piddly mountains in Makkah. They couldn't believe. The largest mountain on the face of this world, earth at this moment goes 9 kilometers. Just under 9 kilometers that way. Above the earth. You know how far down it goes? It goes 125 kilometers. It's rooted 125 five kilometers under the earth and what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the mountains of the day of judgment he says on the mountains on the final hour that they will be like clouds you know like clouds flow that's how they will be and another verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the mountains will be like cotton wool have you ever seen cotton wool of course you've seen cotton wool you know cotton wool yeah you know, this is, you know, have you seen you take cotton wool and you, and you throw it up? How it just floats away? They won't even be like that. Allah is saying that on the day of judgment, the mountains will be manfush actually, manfush actually means when you thread the cotton wool. So you know the little thread, you take out the little thread by thread and then you throw that, that is what Everest will be on the day, day of judgment. That's how it will be. And another word, وَكَانَتُ الْجِبَالُ كَثِيبًا مَحِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it will be, the mountains will be like sand. You know when you pour sand, heaped sand, when you pour it, how light it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that's how it will be on the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the final, لَا تَقُومُ الصَّعْ حَتَّى تَزُولُ الْجِبَالُ عَنْ مُوَاطِنِهَا That the final hour will not be established until the mountains move from their place. The ulama say the mountains move in two different ways. One is haqiqi and one is hissi. One is haqiqi. Haqiqi is when, when the earth moves or due to some earthquake or something that mountain move. And the second is hissi, which is moved through man's intervention. Man's intervention. Now let me take you to no other place besides Mecca. Let me take you to the Ummul Qurra. The center of the Muslims. You look at Makkah. The Prophet ﷺ said in a narration related by Abdullah ibn Umar. It's, and it's recorded by Abdul Razak in his Musannaf. And it's, the narration is jayyid. The narration is jayyid. It's acceptable. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, a time will come that the belly of Makkah will be cleft open. And river-like passages will be dug through. A time will come that the belly of Makkah will be cleft open. Cleft means to make a hole in something, to make a hole in the surface. And there will be river-like passages. Now, this narration baffled the muhaddithin. They couldn't work it out. Why? Because it didn't make any sense to them. So what, the best interpretation they could come out with, that Makkah today is a very dry place. A day will come that Makkah will be a very moist place, a very wet place. If you look historically at Makkah, Makkah was in the center, and then it's surrounded by mountains. Today, Makkah is on each side of the mountains. The ulama say, now today we understand this narration of the Prophet ﷺ. They actually meant that the, the belly of Makkah meant the mountains will be cleft open and you will have river-like passages. If you look at anything, all those passage tunnels look like rivers turn the other way. That's what they look like. Rivers turn upside down. And the ulama say, now we understand this narration. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in the same narration, he said, a time, he, was say, he said that the buildings in Makkah will be higher than the, higher than the mountains. Subhanallah. You look at that monstrosity that they have in Makkah today. You know, you look at the monstrosity that they have in Makkah, that clock tower. You know how, that's one, that's the, that's the tallest clock tower in the world. It's seven times higher than the minaret of the masjid of the Prophet wasallam. It's one of the tallest buildings in the world. One of the tallest buildings in the world. Let me go back to a narration I mentioned to you early on. The first hadith I mentioned in the hadith of Jibra'il when Jibra'il asked the Prophet wasallam about the final sign of the final hour. The Messenger of Allah wasallam said, and tell it, and tell it al-amatu rabbataha wa antara al-huffat al-urrat al-a'la riya' shay yatatawaluna fil bunyan that a time will come that you will see al-huffat al-urrat the barefooted semi-naked destitute shepherds riya' shay they will compete with each other in building the tallest buildings the message of Allah was asked who is the riya' shay who are these shepherds the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said hum al-arab Humul Arab. You look today, subhanAllah. The tallest building in the world is in Dubai. Just over 800 kilometers, uh, uh, just under 800 meters. And now, the, in Kuwait, they want to build what, a building which is called uh, Al Burj Al uh, Mubarak, Al Burj Al Mubarak Al Kabir, a thousand and one meter, just over a kilometer. In Bahrain, they are thinking about, and, and, and all the drawings are made. All the architect drawings are made. The Burjul Marjan, which is 1,022 meters high. So then the Saudis are now want to bring, make the Kingdom Tower. And then comes, and, and there's more to this, I'm just making it brief, others do discuss, and then Walid bin Talal, Prince Walid bin Talal comes into the mix and he's discussing, listen to this, he's discussing about making a building which is 1,600 meters tall. That is twice as tall as the tallest current building. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said 1,400 years ago, and he was asked, who are, who are the Riyal Shah, Shai? And the Messenger of Allah said, Humul Arab. They will be the Arabs. But see, all these buildings, but no Issa. All these buildings, but no Issa. All this dunya, but no respect. You have no say on the world stage. The more you build, the more you ridicule. You have all that wealth, but nobody takes you seriously. Because nobody has ever taken people serious because of the cars that they drive, because of the building that they live in. People take you seriously with what you contribute to humanity. Your human rights. 
are appalling. You treat your workers like rubbish and then you build buildings upon buildings upon buildings. When Umar ibn Khattab anhu went to Sham and he reached Sham and the narrations mentioned that Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah said, Oh, Mirul Mu'mineen, you're going to meet these leaders. These leaders live a pomp and lavish lifestyle. They expect other leaders to be just for a little while. Now, Umar has come all the way from Medina. He's got patchy clothes, old clothes on. They say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, momentarily, just a little while, just change your clothes. In some narrations, it mentioned that he actually did change his clothes. Some mentioned it doesn't. But anyway, the lesson is the same. He said the same statement on both occasions. He entered the tent, he changed his clothes, he went out of the tent, he took a few steps, and then he turned to Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. And he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, kunna qawmun adhillah fa'a'azzana Allahu bil-Islam. He said, we were a base nation and Allah gave us honor through Islam. Not through clothes, not through buildings. Allah gave us honor through Islam. Where will we be if we relinquish the teachings of Islam? And you know, today, wallahi, you know, recently I was in Spain and whilst I was in Spain, I was teaching the history of Spain. So every day, for every other day, uh, I would teach four hours the history of Spain. You know, and the history of Spain is very, very, very touchy. If you really study the history of Spain deeply, wallahi, it, it, it's very, it, it's very, very saddening. So when I finished, everybody said to me, Sheikh, he said, so where, where, were the, where were the North Africans? Where were the Ottomans? They were a superpower at the time. Morocco was what? Just across the 12 miles away. Where were these people? History will remember today. And they will see all the oppression which is going on. And people will ask 100 and 200 years later, where were the Muslims? And you know the same reply which you can give regarding the Muslims of Spain you can give. They were very hap happy in their fiefdoms. They were very happy in their fee for them. They had their little kingdoms. They had their little kingdoms and they were very happy as long as they preserved their kingdoms. Let me tell you what's a current kingdom. And I say this with all due respect, not having a God. Today, what have our kingdom become? Our masjid have become kingdoms here today. Our centers, our institutes. This is true reality. Well, I'll tell you why. Because, see, we build a million pound masjid and then they tell us, listen, you got to say this. And you can't say this, and you can't say this. And we say, okay, we've got to preserve the masjid. Otherwise, we lose the masjid. Otherwise, they're going to target us. And every single masjid, all are thinking exactly the same. Every, and I know this because I work with masjids. Every single masjid is saying, you know, they're right. Every committee member is saying, you know what, I must preserve this fee for them. You know, I work 10 years here, so then they water down your Islam for you. You don't speak about human rights. You don't speak about oppression. You don't speak. You just keep quiet. And then you got a masjid which has no soul. You got a member which has no speeches. Speeches which are just pleasing. This is not what fear. Fear for them come in many forms. And you know, you know, the best word that sums it up is, is Mu'tamid bin Abad. Mu'tamid ibn Abad was a king and he was one of the last kings but he was quite a powerful king but there were loads of other fiefdoms at the time so Alfonso the Christian king got very brave so he only had Mu'tamid to defeat if he defeated Mu'tamid he would have taken the vast majority of Spain in North Africa there was a leader called Yusuf bin Tashfin Yusuf bin Tashfin was a very pious leader the leader of the Murabitun so, you, so Mu'tamid said something. He said, I have two, one of two choices. Either I call Yusuf bin Tashfin to help me, but the possibility with that is that when Yusuf bin Tashfin comes, he might not go back. And he may stay and he may t take over my kingdom as well. Or the other option I have is that I let Alfonso. I stay here and eventually Alfonso will take it. He said, these are the two options that I have. He said, I'd rather take the former than the latter. He said, why? He said, because history will curse me. He said, every Muslim will curse me from the pulpit. That you were the person who gave Muslim Spain to the Christians. And then he said his amazing statement. Wallah, amazing statement. He said, I would rather be a shepherd, a camel herder 
in North Africa under Yusuf bin Tashfi than be a swine herder in Castile under Alfonso. Many Muslims, many Muslims, may Allah guide us of all, you know, we have decided that we rather be swine herders. We rather go with the flow. Your, your dunya will finish, my dear respected brothers. Everybody's dunya will finish. What we, you will take with you is your a'mal. That's it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to briefly finish here. Okay, so, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوسُ حُشِرَتْ what, 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 and, and on that day, this is an amazing verse. Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And when the predatory animals will all huddle together, will all gather together. Why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just say, When the animals will gather all the animals? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the word wuhush? The reason Allah uses the word wuhush, predatory animals, the beast animals. Why? Because see, the nature of the beast animal the nature of the lions, the tigers, the crocodiles is that they never gather in one place. They never gather. But on that day when the trumpet will be blown, they will all gather together. They will all gather. They will be so scared that they will all huddle up together. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And on that day when the tenth month old camel the tenth month old camel will be forsaken. The uh, tenth month old pregnant camel, sorry, sorry, ten, a camel which is ten months pregnant will be forsaken. The most beloved thing to the Arabs was the camel. And then out of the camel that was which was ten months pregnant. It was the Ferrari, it was the Lamborghini, which was a nice area in, in uh, Peterborough. What's a nice area? Huh? West Ham. West Ham. That's in London. I used to support those guys for a while. Uh, West Town. Okay, don't lie to me. Jacob, you live in West Town. Yeah, I, I, I had this one done to me before one place. Okay, wherever. The, your nicest house, your dream house. All this on that day you will forsake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, ittaqu rabbakum, inna zalzalat sa'ati shay'un azim. Allah akbar. He said, O man, fear your Lord, because the zalzala, the shaking of the hour is adheem. Yawma tarawnaha. The day you will see it. Tadhalu kullu murdi'atin amma arba'at. Can you imagine this? Every mother who has her suckling child will leave that child. Suckling child will leave that child. Every woman who is pregnant will lose, will drop her load. And you will see people... That they are, you will see people like they are intoxicated, but they are not intoxicated. Allah Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recalls that day. Let me just finish off here. I, I think I've gone over my time considerably. Let me finish here. Imagine if you were alive on that day. Imagine. Imagine you were alive on that day when Allah, and this is the most important part of the entire speech. Imagine you were alive on that day and the trumpet is blown. What would Allah expect from you? That day, the sun falls. The stars fall out of the heaven like ping pong balls. A mother who's suckling a child leaves her child. The day the animals are all scattered, the seas all come together. The day everything is shaking. What would Allah expect from a believer? There will be no believers. But if you were alive on that day, what would Allah expect from you? The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, amazing narration. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you are alive and the final hour was occurred and you were sowing a seed, finished sowing that seed. What is the purpose? You're sowing a seed, the world is going to end and the message of Allah says, finish sowing that seed. You're not going to reap the fruits of that seed. So what does the message of Allah mean by this? The ulama say that the message of Allah is saying that if you are alive and the trumpet is blown, the horn is blown, and you are doing an action, carry on with that action. No matter how big the trial and tribulation befalls you, when you are doing an action, let nothing prevent you. Let nothing prevent you. And this is what believers are meant to be like. 
We don't blame other people. We don't absolve ourselves of responsibility. The Imam doesn't absolve himself, and you as a congregation don't absolve yourself. The elders don't absolve themselves. And all, you know, the elders say, Ah, oh, yeah, these youngsters are just like the Bikari. Fatini Sunte, they don't listen to us. The youngsters say, You know, these, these old codgers. You know, uh, nothing's going to change until they kind of move on. You know, uh, so, so for the next 20 years, you don't have to do anything. The elders don't have to do anything because the youngsters don't listen. Believers are not people who absolve themselves. We don't blame America for our troubles. In all honesty, we don't blame the government. We don't even blame the Muslim rulers. We know what they're on and we acknowledge what they're on. But we don't blame others. Because believers don't absolve themselves. Believers are people of actions. You know, we, you, know you often hear the elders say, and everybody, now I'm an elder, I say it as well. Say, Ya zamana yesa. Zamana yesa. You know, time is like this. You know, that's the time that we're going through. Imam Shafi rahimahullah says, Naibu zamanana wal aibu fina wa mali zamani naibun siwana. So, Naibu zamanana wal aibu fina. So, we blame time. But the truth is, that they, the fault lies within us. And if time had any one fault, it is that it has to carry the likes of me and you. That is the only fault with time. That me and you exist in that time. So as believers, we are positive people. One of my friends, he's a Mawlana. He said, I met one of the Muslim leaders. I won't mention his name. He said, well, I met one of the Muslim leaders. And I said to him, you know, I saw what's happening in the world and I was concerned. And I said, you know, what's going to change? He said, what's going to change? So, the, so the, this, this guy, I mean, everybody knows this leader's name. I won't mention his name. He goes, nothing's going to change until Imam Mahdi comes. See, now, this is a defeatist mentality. This is a defeatist mentality. The message of Allah. You know, when you look at the hadith, a hadith of the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa amazing. Wallahi, what a positive individual the message of Allah was. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا قَالَ رَجُلْ حَلَكَ النَّاسِ فَهُوَ أَهْلَكَهُمْ When a person says that the people have been destroyed, he's the one who's destroyed them. Why? Because he's created a state of despondency. You don't say, everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say, you know, people have been destroyed, meaning we can't do anything. And you can read this in two ways, like the way I read it, or you can read it with ism tafdeel. إِذَا قَالَ رَجُلْ حَلَكَ النَّاسِ فَهُوَ أَهْلُكُهُمْ When a person says that the people have been destroyed, then he's the most destroyed amongst them. Why? Because he doesn't trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have evil prevailing. This is the nature. What a beautiful statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu was going towards Sham. He reaches Sham, the outskirts of Sham, when he reaches there, he hears that there's a plague in Sham. This is the second time Umar went to Sham. So he reaches the outskirts of Sham and there's a plague. So he discusses it with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And eventually he decides that we won't go into Sham. We won't go because there's a plague. So somebody said to Umar ibn Khattab, he said, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, atafirru min qadrillah. Atafirru min qadrillah. Are you running away from the decree of Allah? Meaning, if you go into Sham, if Allah wants you to become ill, you will become ill. It's the decree of Allah. Atufirru min qadrillah. Look at the answer of Umar ibn Khattab. He said, Naam, nufirru min qadrillah ila qadrillah. What an what a amazing understanding. He said, yes, we are running away from the qadr of Allah, the decree of Allah to the decree of Allah. What does it mean? It means... Look, evil is always going to be there. That is the qadr of Allah. But it's also the qadr of Allah that you do something positive. Haq and ba is the qadr of Allah that batil will exist. But it's the qadr of Allah that haq will exist. But are you going to become that haq? This is the qadr of Allah. In the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, there was a man who stole. And Umar asked him, why do you steal? And he said, Qadrullah. He said, decree of Allah, that's why I stole. So Umar had his hand chopped off, his hand got better. Umar called him back and he whipped him 80 times. He said, you slandered Allah. Allah didn't want you to steal. So it's the Qadr of Allah that things that you're going to be tried and tribulations. But believers are positive people. Subhanallah, let it come, alhamdulillah. 
We remain firm. We remain steadfast for the sake of Allah. We are people who Allah said, "Kuntum khayr ummatin ukrajat linnas." You are the best. Look, you are the best of people taken out for the benefit of humanity. Be those best of people. Do something which makes a change. You know, do something. Don't just sit on your backsides and th- and hope for things to change. Could, this is not the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah creates people. He creates people. But are you going to be that person? Junaid al-Baghdadi rahmatullah alayhi said a beautiful statement. If somebody else said it, you were, people would have put a fatwa kufr on that person. If somebody else said the statement of Umar ibn Khattab, nufirru min qadrillah ila qadrillah, people would have put fatwa. Junaid al-Baghdadi said, he said, a man is he who repels the qadrs of Allah with other qadrs of Allah. A man, a true man is he who repels the qadr of Allah with other qadrs of Allah. Meaning, if Allah has decreed evil to be there, if Allah has decreed evil, then create, be the qadr of Allah which will repel it. And, and, and this is an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all. You know, mashallah, it's beautiful to see so many uh, youngsters here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for being here. You know, these are the future. Get them involved in the masjid. You know, get these guys. I know they're going to make a noise occasionally. Yeah, give them a couple of black hand, backhanders occasionally. No, no, they'll be all right. Yeah. No. Please edit that part, yeah? <laughs> no, get the youngsters involved in the masjid. Alhamdulillah, I'm sure this, mashallah, you have an excellent imam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him istiqama. You know... Make it vibrant. Get the youngsters involved. These are your future. You know, do not be ever believe, be complacent. Wallahi, do not be complacent. If you study the history of Spain, 800 years, proverbial. It was a proverbial state. Most, in the time of Abdurrahman III, the, you could say the most powerful state on the face of this earth. Where is it now? Do not be complacent. Your challenge has just started. Let me tell you. All these churches that we are buying, who says that there's any guarantee that they will remain masjids tomorrow? No guarantee. Unless you make the effort, unless you have some vision, unless you have a vibrant Islam, unless you have an Islam which impacts people's hearts, unless you have people at the forefront who are the cream of the crop, that's it. You have the people who are the cream of the crop, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, this is what they chose. They made the people cream of the crop. Why choose Bilal? The message of Allah, look at all those, look at all those ahadis regarding Adhan, the virtues of Azan. Why choose a slave, an ex-slave? Why? Why not choose a person of Quraysh? Why we, what we would say, you know, if the, why not, if it's Bengali masjid, why? Why not choose a Bengali? Why not choose a Pakistani? Why not choose a Gujarati if it's a Gujarati? You know, this is, why choose Bilal? Why give this man all the virtue? Because he was the best man for the job. That's it. To the degree that, uh, that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu bought Bilal. Look at this. He, he bought Bilal. He went to Umayyah and he said, Umayyah, sell me Bilal. And Umayyah said, I'll sell him to you because you corrupted him in the first place. So he said, how much? He said, 10 gold coins. So he went home and he bought back 10 gold coins and he gave him those 10 gold coins and Umayyah began to laugh. And, and Abu Bakr asked him, Umayyah, what are you laughing for? He said, Abu Bakr, I swear by Allah, if you had haggled with me and offered me one gold coin for Bilal, I would have sold him for one gold coin. And Abu Bakr anhu said, Umayyah, I swear by Allah, if you had asked me for 10, if you had asked me for 100 gold coins for Bilal, I would have given you 100 gold coins. Now look at the Ihsan of, of Abu. He bought him, and then what would he say? He would say, Bilal Sayyidi. Bilal is my master. The best man after the Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam to walk on the face of this earth was Abu Bakr. And he's saying regarding a slave that he bought that he is my master because he didn't look at his status, he didn't look at the color of his skin, he looked at his virtue. Abu Umar ibn Khattab anhu would say, Abu Bakr Sayyiduna wa Ataqa Sayyiduna. Abu Bakr is our master and he freed our master, Bilal anhu. You know, so let's, 
you know, we need, and, and this, this, this emanates from leadership. Emanates from leadership. You know, the masjid needs to be vibrant. You need to have outreach products, a project. Listen, let, let me tell you, nothing's going to change over day, overnight. Let me tell you, dream on. No matter how much good work you will do, there will be always people there to criticize you. Because people are like that. Your Muslim will criticize you. You will have people, elitists in the government who will criticize you. You will have racists who will criticize you. You will have Islamophobes who will criticize you. They come in many shapes and forms. Do you understand? The EDL are formed. Why? It's not because necessarily they dislike Muslims. If they had a chance, they would dislike blacks. But it's not fashionable to dislike blacks anymore. Do you understand? So that's their nature. They're always going to exist. If somebody else pops up tomorrow, they'll dislike that because that's what they are like. You'll have these elitists, you know, uh, you know who go to uh, private schools. They can't take the fact that why are so many young people Hackies so assertive. That's it. As simple as that. How did you migrants become so assertive in our country? It, as clear as that. Let me tell you. That is the underlying issue. For many of them. Not for all of them. And then there are those who are Islamophobes because of ignorance. Because of ignorance. Because they've always seen a negative image of Islam. That's it. But see, see let, me, let me give you an example, and I know I'm taking the time, but let me give you an example. L let's try to understand where they are. Okay? And I always, often give this example. I said, let, let me give you an example. I'm back home in Pakistan in my village, and some Christians come here in my village, and they build the big, what they call, church. Yeah? And then their women start walking around, what they call, semi-naked. Yeah, we'll say, well, what's going on here? Do you understand? Imagine how tolerant, I'm, I'm just trying to, so we, to a degree, we're not justifying, we to a degree understand the other. Because sometimes we fail to understand the other. We would, and then we would do, I think, a lot more than they would do. Yeah, maybe we here wouldn't, because, you know, we've been brought up in a different, but those cousins back there would do a lot more. Do you understand? However, the difference, the fundamental difference is this. Those over there never claim to give people equal rights. Those over here do. That's the difference. That's the fundamental difference. But it's important for us to also understand the other. And the other comes in many forms and shapes. Some are Islamophobes, not because they actually believe what they see on TV. And we've done nothing to change the narrative. And then there are others who have other intentions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who work for his deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who are steadfast for his deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.